Well, I'd like, I'd like to thank the organizers for the very kind invitation to come and speak to you um, here at this uh, very important training session. Um, I, I'll just warn you a little bit. Um, my slides will be somewhat out of order as I did some rearranging prior to coming here. I apologize for that. Um, so the opinions I'm going to express here do not necessarily reflect uh, those of Health Canada. So uh, just a little outline of my, my presentation. Um, I'll begin with the, an overview of ICHQ5A and I'll transition then to the application of platform or modular data, um, which is um, sort of a risk-based exercise where um, uh, the viral clearance capabilities of a process um, are extrapolated to another product. I'll then um, briefly discuss some emerging trends that we've seen at Health Canada, discuss some modernization, and then I'll end with a few ca case studies. So at Health Canada, we are we're charged with the uh, responsibility um, and governed by the Canadian uh, Food and Drugs Act and regulations uh, to ensure the safety um, and efficacy and high quality of all pharmaceuticals and biologic drugs. And one of the uh, most important safety features uh, is uh, the control of viruses for biologics. Um, they are one of the primary adventitious agents of concern and um, so the objective of viral safety is of course to obtain the best reasonable assurance that pro the product is free of virus contamination. There have been cases um, where adventitious viruses have uh, emerged you know, during production of biologics and this highlights the importance of uh, this topic. Um, so one of the tools that we use at Health Canada, um, uh, of course, are guidance documents. And they are not only um, to provide assistance to industry uh, and to uh, healthcare professionals, but it is also a tool utilized by regulators to uh, apply in a fair and consistent manner the mandate of Health Canada. So uh, guidance documents uh, are not, um, their administrative tools, they are not a force of law and therefore there is some flexibility uh, that is contained within guidance documents um, and sponsors uh, may um, uh, be flexible with, with how the guidance documents are interpreted and applied. Um, by that same token, regulators uh, at Health Canada reserve the right to uh, question the sponsors and ask questions of the sponsor related to their approach um, to ensure that there's uh, an adequate oversight of safety uh, and, and quality of the products. So for viral safety, um, the main guidance document, of course, that, that is utilized at Health Canada is ICHQ5A. Uh, there are other guidance documents from other jurisdictions like EMEA and FDA. There's also a USP chapter on considerations for performance of viral clearance studies. Uh, but these are all um, rooted in ICHQ5A and stem from ICHQ5A. Um, so ICHQ5A um, came into being in 1998 and it was adopted by Health Canada in 2001. So there has been a, a number of years that have passed since its initial um, incorporation or, or um, adoption. And so the, there is um, uh, some need for modernization of ICHQ5A and I will touch on that uh, a little bit later. So now I'll transition into an overview of uh, Q5A. So the viruses can make their way into biologic products um, at many different levels. Um, so at the um, 
when the cell winds. Um, so I'll, I'll just back up just a bit here. ICHQ5A stipulates or um, the scope of ICHQ5A applies to cell uh, products that are derived from cell banks. So as I stated, cell, um, viruses may enter into cell uh, banks and products at various levels. So at the generation level of the cell line, there, there could be, um, they may be um, generated using a virus. Uh, they may be introduced, uh, viruses may become introduced into the cell bank through uh, raw materials of, of animal or human origin. Uh, so there has to be, um, and there could be two types, there could be endogenous uh, uh, or um, uh, exogenously introduced viruses. Um, adventitious viruses um, may also be introduced during production. So this could be through contaminated raw materials of biological origin, such as serum. Uh, there may be the use of a virus during the manufacture of the product, as is the case in, with um, uh, CAR-T cell uh, therapies. Um, there could be contaminated reagent or excipients. And it could also be introduced during uh, cell and medium handling. So there's three main uh, pillars or three pillars of viral clearance uh, in ICH uh, Q5A. There's the cell substrate testing, which involves testing of the master cell bank, the working cell bank, and the cells at the limit of in vitro age. Um, and also that it what is involved is testing of the, um, of the media as well. Uh, there's the second pillar is the testing of the unprocessed bulk. And this is looking for uh, any adventitious agents that may have become um, introduced into the process stream uh, during the, uh, the culturing or fermentation period. And the third pillar is the process, process clearance capability. And in the event that uh, viruses have not been detected um, in the unprocessed bulk uh, or in the cell substrate testing, the process clearance capability uh, builds into the process the ability of the process to clear any viruses that may have been introduced or may have been missed. And it adds an extra layer of assurance that the product is safe and uh, from a virus perspective. So ICHQ5A is a general framework for virus testing. Uh, it is a recommended approach, um, but given that, uh, that being said, manufacturing processes are diverse. Um, so ICHQ5A recommendations are used differently depending on the manufacturing process. With applications, the sponsor should clearly describe and justify their overall viral safety strategy and also provide an overall summary of their viral safety assessment. So now I'll discuss a little bit more detail than pillar one, cell substrate testing. So the most um, Comprehensive testing of the cell substrate is on the master cell bank, but there's also required testing on the working cell bank and also cells at the end of production. There's also a requirement for testing of other raw materials such as media components. And the type and extent of the testing um, and the viral tests employed uh, will vary uh, and is considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So some of these um, uh, factors include, um, I'll draw attention to the product type and intended clinical use. So it may be that a product that is for a patient who has undergone and failed two rounds of, of uh, standard therapy, um, perhaps chemotherapy, versus a patient uh, or an indication whereby um, it's a pediatric indication and it's, um, the patient is otherwise um, healthy. 
there may be a different requirement for vir viral testing. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go on. Um, it, it's, um, it's always a case-by-case -case basis in terms of how um, we enforce ICHQ5A. So as I mentioned, the master cell bank undergoes the most extensive screening for endogenous and non-endogenous viruses. Um, The working cell bank um, is tested for adventitious virus um, directly from the bank or on cells at the limit of in vitro cell age. So if the non-endogenous virus tests were performed on the master cell bank and on cells derived from the working cell bank at or beyond the limit of cell age, then these tests are not necessary for the working cell bank. The cells at the limit of in vitro cell age should be evaluated once for endogenous viruses that may have been undetected in the master cell bank and the working cell bank. And they should also be evaluated uh, for suitable in vitro and in vivo non-endogenous tests for assurance that the process is not prone to adventitious virus contamination. So, Specific tests may be necessary um, for in specific applications or if a specific virus is present in a cell substrate. For human cell substrates, um, these should always be tested for specific viruses. For example, human immunodeficiency virus, um, hepatitis causing viruses. And this, uh, I, I will draw attention to this a little bit later um, with respect to cell and gene therapies. Um, PCR-based assays, for detecting sequences of specific viruses can be used. And novel technologies may be used as well with adequate supporting data. So some of the virus detection tests that are used for retroviruses, um, infectivity should, uh, assays should be performed in susceptible cell lines. Also transmission electron microscopy should be performed and also, if the first two tests do not detect any virus, then reverse trans transcriptase assay is, is to be used according to ICHQ5A. So in vitro tests uh, utilize a wide range, should utilize a wide range of cell lines amenable to, to infection, um, not a wide array of cell lines, but a, a wide um, cell lines that are um, amenable to infection by a wide range of viruses. Um, from various species. As a requirement, there should be a human cell line, which is often MRC5, and a non-human primate cell line, which is often Vero. And the, the choice of other cell lines, um, typically one extra, one other cell line beside those two would re be reflective of the origin, uh, the species origin of the, of the cell bank. For in vivo assays, um, Suckling in adult mice and embryonated eggs should be used. Uh, for antibody production tests, these are typically utilized um, for cell substrates of rodent origin. So now on to pillar two, testing for virus and unprocessed bulk. So this is... Um, Testing that occurs in the production bioreactor uh, following the fermentation um, process. And this is typically the highest probability for detection of viruses that may be present um, in, the, in, the, in the production. Uh, generally speaking, cells and culture media are, are tested. And data from three lots, um, typically in vitro screening tests, um, are required according to ICHQ5A. And development programs for ongoing assessment of adventitious virus and production batches um, should be implemented. So now on to pillar three, viral, viral clearance studies. These are, these are performed at small scale uh, to evaluate the clearance of viruses um, known to be present or to provide assurance that undetected viruses um, inadvertently introduced can be cleared effectively. So normally a subset of process steps are 
considered to be effective for inactivating um, or removing viruses, and these should be justified and explained. And the overall process um, assesses quantitatively in logarithmic units uh, the virus reduction capability of, the, of the each unit operation. Uh, and this is done by spiking a uh, high titer virus into crude material of different fractions and demonstrating that the virus removal and activation achieved uh, uh, during subsequent steps. And use of viruses of different biochemical and biophysical properties um, uh, provides an indication of the robustness of the viral clearance capabilities of the process. And I'll get into a little bit more detail about some of these uh, in a moment. So there are different types of viruses depending on the situations, and these are outlined uh, clearly in ICHQ5A. I'll go over these um, quickly. Uh, relevant, specific, and non-specific viruses. So relevant viruses are, it is either the identified virus in a, in a cell substrate or a virus of the same species. Uh, and these are, would be utilized in the viral clearance studies to provide the most relevant physical chemical model for clearance of that particular virus. So model viruses, there's two types. There's, there's specific model viruses and there's non-specific. The specific viral model viruses are closely related, the same genus typically of the known or suspected virus. Um, so an example would be murine leukemia virus as a specific model virus for endogenous type C, A, or R retrovirus-like particles that are found in some of our, uh, some of the production cell lines that are used, or pseudorabies virus for uh, EBV that, um, found in immortalized B lymphocytes. Non-specific model viruses are more are generic viruses that uh, represent a, a broad range of physical chemical attributes or characteristics and are used for assessing the general clearance capability of a process. So in terms of time dependence of inactivation steps, typically there's two types of virus inactivation. Um, that would be low pH or detergent. And the kinetics of inactivation are such that uh, there's uh, a time dependence to that, and that should be understood um, and demonstrated. Uh, robustness, reproducibility, and evaluation of process parameters is um, important in that um, ranges of process parameters should be um, understood uh, and, and evaluated not to impact on the virus clearance capability of a unit operation. So I'll quickly go over the uh, different cases. Now case A and case B are the by far the most common cases. Um, cases C, D, and E, um, we don't see, um, and I have not seen in, in my time at Health Canada. Um, uh, case A is when no viruses are detected, and this would require the use of the non-specific model viruses. Case B is one of the more common um, occurrences. Um, Chinese hamster ovary cells, which is a, a predominant workhorse for biotech, um, has endogenous rodent retrovirus-like particles that are believed non-pathogenic. And in this case, it would require the use of a specific model virus, and um, the murine leukemia virus, purified bulk testing using suitable methods. For marketing authorization, data from three lots of purified bulk. However, Q5A states that CHO um, and other cell lines that have a history of safe use um, where the endogenous particles are characterized and clearance is demonstrated, it's not necessary to assay for non-infectious particles in purified bulk, and studies with non-specific model viruses are appropriate. That being said, the gold standard for, uh, pardon me, gold standard um, is the use of the um, specific model virus, murine leukemia virus, uh, to demonstrate removal of retrovirus-like particles and mitigation of that risk. 
As I mentioned, um, case C, D, and E um, are very infrequent and very infrequently observed. Um, so case C is when there's uh, a virus but no evidence of capacity for infecting humans. So in that case, um, virus removal or inactivation studies should use the identified virus or a relevant or specific model virus. Time-dependent inactivation at critical inactivation step should be performed and there should be purified bulk testing. Case D is when a known human pathogen has been identified and this is only acceptable in exceptional circumstances. Case E is when an unclassified virus is detected and the product is almost always unacceptable. So the use of model viruses in, in clearance studies, um, the, the viruses should resemble viruses that may contaminate the product according to Q5A. An example of course is murine leukemia virus which is uh, representative of retrovirus like particles found in CHO cells. They should also represent a wide range of physical chemical properties. For example, various sizes. As shown here, we have parvo uh, parvoviruses, very small. Then we have rheoviruses, which is an intermediate size virus. And we have two examples of uh, envelope viruses that are larger in size, um, the retrovirus and herpes virus here. So the choice a virus with respect to the study objective should be justified. So another important um, thing to keep in mind is the scientific justification for selection of worst case conditions. Uh, for example, um, with column matrix um, and uh, validation of performance of the column matrix. It should be understood uh, what the worst case is. For example, if the column matrix is more effective, um, whether it's new or whether it's been used multiple times, this should be understood and the worst case should be used to calculate the viral clearance. So. It, a comprehensive and robust validation of viral clearance and activation that is well supported minimizes uh, regulatory interactions. So in terms of the process and selection of steps where to uh, incorporate viral clearance or inactivation, um, there's a number of, it is up to the sponsor to determine which steps they would like to um, introduce viral clearance steps. And it's, it's an interplay between the process and the opportunities where viral clearance can occur. So um, certainly the inclusion of a pH adjustment vessel that is a, is a dedicated viral inactivation step and the viral filtration is a dedicated viral removal step. Now there's some flexibility along the way where to incorporate other virus removal steps. For example, if we have an anion exchange, I'll just back up a bit, protein A affinity chromatography, that could be validated as a, a viral removal or clearance step. Anion exchange is one of the um, more robust virus clearance steps that are used. Another polishing step, which could be cation exchange chromatography, could also be used um, as well. So in our experience in Health Canada, typical virus clearance um, that we see employs a virus inactivation step, whether it be a low pH or a detergent treatment, a separation step, which is quite often anion exchange, there could be two steps in there as well. And a viral filtration step is very often uh, observed as well. It's important to consider that all three methods must employ different mechanisms of clearance to be considered in the additive calculation of viral, overall viral clearance. So that each of these steps, the low pH inactivates envelope viruses by physical chemical means 
anion exchange physically removes virus particles based on charge, and filtration removes virus particles by size exclusion. So th this is a kind of a, a model of um, an approach that a sponsor has taken. Um, so here they utilized a wide range of viruses that are representative of many different physical chemical um, attributes. For example, different sizes. Uh, some are different viral families. Some are envelopes, some are not. Um, and so what was included was several different process steps where vir virus removal or inactivation was validated. And we can see that some viruses are more amenable to removal at certain process steps than others. Um, a good a case in point is the MMV model virus for parvoviruses is only removed by the viral filtration step. We have pseudorabies virus um, is removed, not, protein A is not effective for removing pseudorabies virus. And each of the log values or the log um, clearance values are then tabulated to form the total log, clear, or log viral clearance for that particular virus. So typically two independent studies uh, to demonstrate inactivation or clearance are required um, by Q5A. For a marketing authorization application, four nonspecific model viruses um, and for clinical trial applications, two nonspecific model viruses are, are typically what we would, um, we would ask for. Um, although, again, as I mentioned, this could vary on a case-by-case -case basis. For marketing applications, column lifetime and clearance capability should be evaluated, uh, and also an assurance that there is no carryover of virus following column cleaning. Other considerations to um, are, um, there are numerous other considerations to keep in mind. Um, one of them is certainly the minimum quantity of virus reliably quantitated. This, this should be uh, known by the, by the sponsor. It's the capability of your detection method. Parallel control assays, and the, these are performed uh, to provide assurance that is, it is the actual viral clearance step that is providing the reduction in, in log uh, virus and not the virus being inactivated by putting it into a buffer or what have you. Changes in buffer, media, and reagents may impact the viral clearance. The virus inactivation time is time dependent and the conditions of the study should reflect the commercial or the full scale process. And buffers may interfere with indicator cells or um, be antiviral. Okay, so as I mentioned, or, uh, orthogonal process steps cannot be included in virus reduction calculations. And it's also important to note that upstream changes may change the amount of virus, and downstream changes may impact viral clearance capabilities and necessitate evaluation of a reevaluation of viral clearance. So we have a, a post NOC guidance document or a post approval guidance document to Health Canada, and we um, pay very close attention to any changes in the manufacturing process as they may impact uh, the viral clearance capabilities. So now I'll transition to um, discussing the application of platform or modular data. Um, this is a uh, a newer approach to um, viral clearance. So as I mentioned, um, platform data is a, a set of conditions that are utilized for uh, removal of viruses that, that apply, can apply to a, a product type. So if, if we're talking about immunoglobulins, um, recombinant antibodies, it would have to be um, applied to another product that is of the same class or same type of, of antibody. And so this is providing this, providing a, a set of data 
that has been worked out for one product and applying it to another in place of completing the full viral clearance uh, package. So the use of platform data to replace actual virus clearance data um, or, um, or the use of um, modular data, it can be acceptable, um, but there is risk associated with applying that, that type of data. So both are based on published or historical data using other products and or manufacturing processes. So as I mentioned, the, the same class or, and subclass of light and heavy chain um, uh, should be, it should be applied to a similar type of product. If not, a justification would have to be provided. A, certainly a similar manufacturing process also. Each, the more different the application becomes, uh, the greater the amount of risk associated should be also the same uh, source. So for example, if it's a CHO cell line, it should also, that the platform data was generated in, then it should only be applied to products um, that come from CHO. So this is a risk-based approach to viral safety and it's in line with the enhanced approach um, for the development and manufacture of biologicals and the principles described in ICH Q8 and Q11 guidance documents. And it addresses the uncertainty of the application of platform or modular data um, knowledge or, or knowledge to the viral clearance validation for the product in question. So it can be acceptable from a scientific perspective. However, um, there's a risk assessment involved. And the goal of the risk assessment is to identify parameters or attributes that may impact the viral clearance or an activation molecular mechanism. So it is important to consider the variability of the critical parameters and attributes and where parameter ranges are not supported by the platform data. So in that case, additional data or strong justification must be provided to address that gap. So for example, if, if there's host cell proteins for the platform data, the validated range was this far, and then for the new process, the host cell protein range is, is higher, then that gap has to be addressed, either, either by providing data to support that higher level of host cell proteins, or by providing a strong justification. Um, I kind of... Um, misfired on my slide here. So, um, so the use of platform or modular data is not, um, there's no international consensus at this point for the use of modular platform data. So um, uh, until that time comes, it's, a, it's assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Right. So I apologize for that. Um, so um, so an evaluation of the broader impact of the variability of the process in question of the application of modular platform data should be, should be made. Um, and what this means is there must be a consideration of the impact of process variability on the viral clearance. So if we use the host cell protein example again, um, if the um, levels of host cell protein are outside of the validated range, then it must be uh, demonstrated uh, that it does not impact the, the unit operation in question or any subsequent downstream unit operations as well. So it is very important to determine the variability of the different critical parameters and attributes. So, clearly explain the applicability of the results to your specific product. 
and because the use of small-scale models is used, any differences in the small-scale models um, must be acknowledged and justified and explained. All parameters must be identified and the attributes that may affect the mechanism of virus clearance um, with respect to the, the attributes that may affect the mechanism of clearance or inactivation. As I mentioned, the, there's the host cell proteins uh, that could be impacted, um, different buffers, composition, pH, uh, different um, process um, conditions such as temperature and pressure or different materials all may have an impact on the clearance of, of viruses um, and these should all be addressed in the, in the risk assessment. Uh, any uh, parameters not expected um, to um, impact viral clearance um, may not be considered. So the contribution of the specific virus clearance and activation step to the overall virus clearance claim um, uh, should be uh, provided uh, and discussed. Now, um, the determination of robustness of each viral clearance and activation step could be um, looking at um, different viruses of different types, um, uh, expanding or exploring uh, a different ranges of process parameters to have a robust understanding of the, of the, um, the platform approach of viral clearance. Um, it's a QBD type um, understanding, it's an enhanced understanding of the process and if uh, the more one knows about the platform process, um, the, the better the understanding and the better, the lower the risk. So every modular or platform uh, claim will be scrutinized. However, there is a distinction to be made between modular and platform with respect to acceptability and scope. Both may be acceptable at the clinical trial stage. And we can envision a broader scope for uh, modular data. Um, modular uh, data could be the best starting point since it does seem less complex and easier to support and accept. So, as I mentioned, um, platform and modular data is a more holistic approach to understanding viral clearance and inactivation capabilities, um, and it may be acceptable. Um, risk control should be based on a comprehensive and solid science-based approach, and the use of modular or platform data to replace validation studies should be discussed in advance with uh, the regulatory authorities, um, including BGTD, um, to avoid the possible finding that it, applicable regulatory requirements have not been met. So now I'll switch gears to emerging trends in modernization. Um, so um, as I mentioned, um, Q5A came into being in 1998 and there has been a number of advances um, uh, in this, the field of science and virus um, biology um, and production uh, sciences. So um, with that, there's perhaps the need to, to include a few more items into Q5A. Um, cell and gene therapies uh, are, are not um, specifically within the scope of um, Q5A. Um, and Health Canada has been actively involved in ICH uh, for a long time and will contribute to um, ongoing ICH efforts. The inclusion of uh, novel technologies such as next generation sequencing. Um, there's um, even genetically altered, less infectable cell substrates. Um, there's a lot of technology that um, may need to be considered um, in the next iteration of Q5A. So I'm going to take a moment to discuss some observations we've seen um, at Health Canada with some of our reviews. Um, so the first observation um, was with a site change for a manufacturing process um, and with that site change came um, a variability in the amount of retrovirus like particles detected um, that differed by a, a, um, two orders of magnitude and this is likely due to um, just normal variation of the method for measuring retrovirus like particles. 
Um, with clinical trial applications, uh, marketing, um, sorry, viral clearance capabilities for unit operations seem to be increasing. And the, the question is, is it higher, tighter stocks, um, better clearance capability? And the, um, the way that viral clearance studies are performed, higher, tighter stocks um, certainly makes, uh, is, is the likely, um, is the likely reason because uh, the, according to Q5A, um, only a small volume of viruses added to the clearance study. So higher, tighter stocks would allow one to uh, maximize the viral clearance capability of a, of a unit operation. Another example is the sponsor did not provide TEM data for quantitation of retroviral particles and unprocessed bulk. The sponsor withdrew uh, the appli the, their application and resubmitted the trial once the data was obtained. Um, and another um, clinical trial application, a model virus was found to adhere to the product during viral clearance studies. Um, so there are some, uh, some definite, some, that would be a good case for parallel control studies. And cell and gene therapies, we're seeing a lot of cell and gene therapies come into Health Canada, particularly AAV-mediated uh, gene therapies. And it's, it's um, pertinent to note that um, uh, genetically modified vectors are excluded from the scope of ICHQ5A, but sponsors are, are applying the principles of Q5A in their applications. And we've seen virus reduction filtration steps. Um, Although in this case, um, with a higher pore size that would allow the product to pass through, but would capture all viruses that are above a certain threshold in size. Okay, so now I'll, I'll finish my talk with um, some case studies, and I will preface the case studies with um, some of our regulatory expectations at Health Canada. Um, what we expect, the data we expect to see um, with applications. Um, these are, these will not be in your booklets uh, and I apologize, apologize for that. So um, in terms of product life cycle expectations, um, there are some slight differences in, in our expectations with regard to viral clearance data. In Division 5 of the, of the Canadian Food and Drug Regulations stipulates um, that the the product um, must be safe, and um, CTAs at Health Canada are assessed for safety only um, from the quality perspective, and it's, a, it's about risk minimization. So our expectations uh, at Health Canada for clinical trials, and they will, um, one thing that is consistent through all clinical trials is that there should be a retrovirus safety margin that is ideally 10 to the 6th. This is not always achievable, um, and it's important to consider that, um, that the retrovirus-like uh, particles um, in CHO are uh, a theor theoretical safety risk, um, and there is um, some room um, uh, for al allowment of, of a lesser safety margin, and these are, this is um, on a case-by-case -case basis always. Whenever human cell substrates are the, um, are the cell source, uh, this, there's screening for human pathogenic viruses. Uh, raw materials of human or animal origin, um, there's always viral testing for species-specific pathogenic viruses. Um, for um, uh, fetal bovine serum, if it's utilized in the production of a cell substrate, the TSC safety evaluation. And typically for um, clinical trial applications, Viral inactivation or clearance should be um, for at least two process steps and at least two model viruses. But again, this, um, this is a case-by-case -case basis. As we move on to marketing applications, um, the expectations around retrovirus remain the same. We may be um, more insistent on the 10 to the 6 safety margin uh, in this situation. Um, so a lot of the other, the, the items uh, that are bolded um, are extra requirements for marketing applications. So um, for cell bank testing, um, sorry, for uh, data from at least three lots of unprocessed bulk um, evaluated for in vitro virus detection. Um, 
there should be an unprocessed bulk testing program in place. Um, and then for viral inactivation and clearance, at least three process steps, at least three model viruses, and column lifetime validation. So as I mentioned earlier, um, with post-market changes, um, Mr. Hugo Humel, who just gave his presentation earlier, um, was uh, a key person in our post-approval guidance document, or what we call our post-NOC guidance. And any changes to manufacturing that may impact the viral and activation clearance capability of the process um, uh, must be either a strong justification or they must, they, the viral um, clearance must be revalidated. Re so case study number one was a, is a therapeutic monoclonal antibody and it's a post-approval change. And the change is a primary parvovirus detection method, which is the 324K cell-based method, was changed to a real-time PCR detection method. Um, in ICHQ5A it states, if appropriate, a PCR test or other suitable methods may be used. And in the Health Canada post-NOC guidance document, if there's a new method, um, it should maintain or improve precision, accuracy, specificity, and sensitivity. So the sponsor provided um, uh, a comprehensive validation um, demonstrating specificity, precision, sensitivity, and robustness. And in the end, it turned out that the PCR assay was more sensitive um, than the 324K cell-based assay. Okay, I'll skip ahead to, to this case study. Um, now, this was a... Um, I apologize for the uh, um, scantness of information in this. This was something that was just brought to my attention shortly before I, I was leaving. Um, but it was for a viral vaccine, and there's the identification of a parvovirus sequence. Uh, by NGS, Next Generation Sequencing. And if any of you are unfamiliar with, with what Next Generation Sequencing is, it's a very, very sensitive method um, whereby um, uh, a, a very broad range of sequence data is, is generated. Um, and so this parvovirus sequence which was detected um, was traced back to serum utilized in the production of the vaccine. Um, the levels of sequence did not increase in the product, which is suggestive that um, there is no active replication taking place. But this is a good in, um, example of the use of a new technology and the, the things that can happen when a new technology is employed. This level of parvovirus sequence may not have ever been detected otherwise. And... Um, and maybe at inconsequential levels. And as it turned out, the, with the investigation, it's not a safety concern, but it's being monitored. The fourth, uh, the next case study is an AAV gene therapy product, which is timely because we are, as I mentioned, we're getting a lot of these applications. It's a phase three clinical trial. And um, the sponsor provided information, um, and this, this may not have been emphasized enough in this talk, but facility risk mitigation measures to minimize and prevent ingress of adventitious agents. Um, there's discussion of the engineering systems, the filtration steps for media, buffers, environmental monitoring. Uh, these are all measures that, that um, minimize the risk of ingress of adventitious agents, which is important. Um, so raw materials of human or animal origin were found to comply with EMEA 41001. Adventitious viruses, um, the sponsor discussed their use of a well-characterized cell line. These, they established a cell bank system um, for production of the vector. In vitro testing was performed for a wide range of viruses in the cell banks. So the, in parentheses, is the pillar of viral clearance that is, that is included. So with the master cell bank, a rever reverse transcriptase assay, TEM, bovine virus screening, in vitro testing, and in vivo viral detection assays. For the working cell bank, they did in vitro testing. Um, for the human cell line, they of course tested for a range of human pathogenic viruses. 
Routine in vitro testing for virus and production cultures is performed, so each drug substance batch tested for microbial contamination, mycoplasma, bovine viruses, and adventitious agents. Evaluation of virus removal and activation capacity, the third pillar of viral clearance. They utilized three model viruses and assessed three process steps. So this is um, an example of a, of a very good um, viral clearance package for a phase three clinical trial. Um, and I wasn't quite finished yet. Retroviral safety margin, they determined. Um, they actually did TEM and found that no RVLP particles were detected. So in that case, what they use is the, the, um, the TEM detection limit and calculate the retroviral clearance based on that number. And with that, they achieved a 10 to the 6 uh, viral clearance, which is acceptable. So I'll finish my talk with um, a case study um, on CAR T-cell products. Um, we've had two products now approved in Canada. Um, and there's some, interest, some key points with this type of um, product that should be noted, as this is a special case. Um, and it's certainly a special case for, for the application of viral clearance. So autologous cell products, which are products that are sp um, specific to the patient. So it is the patient's own cells that is the product. And um, they're not amenable, this type of product is not amenable to an activation or viral clearance by filtration or column chromatography as this would be detrimental to the product. So also in vitro testing on unprocessed bulk for cell product is not entirely feasible for autologous products. One lot for um, this type of product represents each patient that is being treated. And this would, um, this is a, a very onerous, uh, would be a very onerous testing process. So instead, the sponsors um, provide uh, information on virus risk. And it's mitigated in the following ways. So the control of animal and human-derived raw materials through certificates of analysis, certificates of origin, and uh, certificates of suitability. Human-derived proteins and serum are screened for human viruses. So both the vector and the patient cells, so the apheresis product from which the product is, is made, are screened for adventitious viruses. And the manufacturing uh, is as closed as possible. Um, gowning, gloves, and a GMP su um, facility, suitable air handling and cleaning. Um, with respect to the um, the prior point here, um, the patient cells are screened for adventitious viruses. So what this does is minimizes the, the, the risk for cross-contamination in the manufacturing facility um, between uh, patient samples. And also comprehensive risk assessments were performed. So pardon the busyness of this slide, but I, I tried to um, just demonstrate side by side the two products and their approaches um, and how they um, approached at the vector um, stage of production and I'll talk about how they approached viral clearance at the um, or viral risk mitigation at the, at the cell level as well. So they each produced, um, uh, performed a, a wide array of testing on the master cell bank and the working cell bank. Um, in the case of product B, um, a wide range of tests were, were performed on all three, master cell bank, working cell bank, and under production cells. In case of product A, um, a wide range of tests was performed on the, MC, the master cell bank, in vitro assays on the working cell bank, and a, a range of tests on the end of production cells. At the cell level, um, Looking at the uh, risk mitigation was um, performed by um, applying controls to a lot of the um, components that go into the manufacture of the cell product. Um, they differ, of course, because they use different manufacturing processes, 
but the inclusion of any ingredient into the production of the cells is tightly controlled, um, including um, certificates of analysis. Each human-derived product is tested for all human viruses um, and such. Uh, in terms of um, risk of the retroviral vector that is used to transduce the cells, the um, sponsors provided validation data that indicated that the virus is removed um, or a suitable justification that the virus um, used to transduce the CAR T cells um, is removed from the product. So in conclusion, um, virus contamination is certainly a major concern for biologic products. Um, the key to ICHQ5A are the three pillars regarding virus inactivation and clearance. It's important to understand with biologic products that, and processes that they are diverse and they need to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. There are different approaches to viral inactivation and clearance and there's a consideration of risk that, that has to take place with that. Uh, modular or platform data may be acceptable um, and ICHQ5A will be the subject of modernization uh, to reflect scientific advances in the last uh, 21 years or so. With that, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention and I welcome any questions.